Today, inflation fears still haunt, especially Australia. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and Lotus Web Notice Post covering finance and property news. The Washington-based IMF just published its biannual World Economic Outlook, which said that central banks had scored a major achievement to return inflation to the pre-pandemic average without inflicting a global recession. They say that at the top line, global growth is expected to remain stable yet underwhelming. However, notable revisions have taken place beneath the surface since April 2024, with upgrades to the forecast for the US offsetting downgrades to those for other advanced economies, in particular the largest European countries. Likewise, in emerging markets and developing economies, disruptions to production and shipping of commodities, especially oil, conflicts, civil unrest and extreme weather events have led to downward revisions to the outlook for the Middle East and Central Asia, and that for Sub-Saharan Africa. These have been compensated for by upgrades to the forecast for emerging Asia, where surging demand for semiconductors and electronics, driven by significant investments in AI, has bolstered growth, a trend supported by substantial public investment in China and India. Five years from now, they say, Global growth should reach 3.1%. That's a mediocre performance compared with the pre-pandemic averages. And they go on to say that economic developments over the past four years have had a lot to do with how individual countries have deployed fiscal and monetary policies since the pandemic. Following an initial period of easing, monetary policy has tightened significantly with central banks in many emerging markets starting earlier than major central banks in advanced economies. Most central banks stopped increasing policy rates in the first half of 2023, but real rates continue to rise as inflation expectations started to decline, tightening the monetary policy stance further. Real policy rates are currently above estimates of the neutral rate and thus are acting to cool down economic activity and bring inflation back to target. Higher policy rates have led to higher mortgages and also bank lending rates, a sign that the first leg of monetary transmission has worked as expected, they say. The pass through to market rates have been gradual but seem to have finished. The increase in borrowing costs has in turn held back private credit growth and investment, moderating aggregate demand. But in contrast, fiscal policy is in a different place. Despite a strong rebound in activity in 2022 and generalised inflationary pressures, fiscal policy has remained loose. Some slippage with respect to consolidation plans is evident, except in low-income developing countries where limited fiscal space has constrained their ability to tackle energy and food crises. From 2022 to 2024, monetary policy tightened significantly in most countries, but fiscal policy lagged and even eased in many instances, complicating the task of central banks in their effort to rein in inflation and delaying the necessary rebuilding of fiscal buffers. Tighter monetary policy combined with relatively loose fiscal policy, particularly relevant in the US, may be one of the key factors that has led to dollar appreciation in 2024. Now, they argue that ahead, necessary fiscal consolidation in many economies is expected to slow down growth and it calls for looser monetary policy, which should in turn help governments trim deficits more easily. Though in practice, there is actually little evidence yet of fiscal tightening and government debt is still growing in many countries. Despite ongoing geopolitical tensions, global trade volume as a share of world GDP, has not deteriorated so far. However, signs of geoeconomic fragmentation have started to emerge, with increasingly more trade occurring within geopolitical blocks rather than between them. Specifically, when the averages for the period of 2017 to 2022 and 2022 to the first quarter of 2024 are compared, goods trade growth 
is observed to have declined by around two and a half percentage points more between geopolitically distant blocks than within blocks. They go on to say a more fragmented global trade landscape would emerge if geopolitical tensions continue to develop in a way similar to what happened during the Cold War. Although fragmentation, if it goes hand in hand with an increase in intra block trade, may not necessarily imply rapid deglobalization, it could reduce the resilience of global supply chains, increase funding costs, disrupt cross border capital flows, and lower market efficiency. Also, it would slow the transfer of knowledge between advanced and emerging markets and developing economies, which would hamper income convergence, increase costs, and increase risk for businesses and also induce a large economic cost for the green transition. Now, against that black cloth, the report shows that Australia is tipped to record the second highest inflation rate out of 42 countries next year. It's posing a sharp contrast to other advanced economies. While the IMF says in most countries inflation is now hovering close to central bank targets, paving the way for monetary easing across major central banks. Australia is an outlier, with an inflation forecast to be higher than most other foreign peers, but better employment conditions than other advanced economies. Central banks in Canada, Britain, New Zealand and the US raise policy rates above 5% to tame inflation, while the RBA stopped raising rates at 4.35%. Those four central banks have then cut interest rates in recent months, while RBA Governor Michelle Bullock has said the board does not expect to reduce borrowing costs this year in Australia. It was a deliberate choice for us not to tighten as much as we could have done in order to try to protect those employment gains, RBA Deputy Governor Andrew Hauser said on Monday. The Consumer Price Index, 3.8% in the June quarter, is forecast by the IMF to temporarily dip to 3% at the end of this year, partially due to energy bill rebates, including $300 from the federal government and other states, including $1,000 from Queensland, although, of course, the RBA looks through those. That support, combined with income tax cuts on July the 1st, helped push consumer confidence last week to its highest level since January 2023, according to the latest ANZ Ray Morgan Consumer Confidence Index. But inflation is forecast to jump higher to 3.6% by the end of 2025 as the energy bill subsidies expire. Only the Slovak Republic, which has experienced a sharp rise in food and energy costs, is forecast to record a higher inflation rate of 4.8% next year. The flip side is that local unemployment rates are tipped to creep up only slightly from 4.1% to 4.4% by the end of 2025. That's one of the lowest jobless rates in the world. Record numbers of people, including women, are in the labour market. That was shown in the better than expected jobs data that came out last week that showed that more than 64,000 people found work in September, cementing market economists' expectations the RBA will leave the cash rate unchanged until February 2025 at the earliest in fact, money market investors who bet on interest rates delayed their anticipated cut of the RBA to the 20th of May 2025, which is only four days before the latest potential date for a federal election. The repricing from a February rate cut that was expected earlier in the month came after the RBA Deputy Governor Andrew Hawser dampened expectations the bank could cut interest rates aggressively next year and talked about the strength of the jobs market. Global bond yields have also drifted higher as markets have priced in a potential Donald Trump presidency, stoking inflation with large tariffs coming through, making it harder for the US Fed to continue interest rate cuts. Now, in contrast, New Zealand's unemployment rate jumped by 1.4 percentage points from its low point in 2022 to 4.6% this year. Canada's unemployment rate has risen 1.7 percentage points to 6.5%. The US unemployment rate over the past two years moved up broadly in line with Australia to 4.1%. And yet, 
in New Zealand, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's Monetary Policy Committee is still thinking about lingering price pressures, even as it cuts interest rates to reflect a lower inflation outlook. Governor Andrew Orr said in a speech to the Peterson Institute in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday. However, these uncertainties are now set against a lower central outlook for inflation. He said, in New Zealand, uncertainties about firms' price-setting behaviour and the persistence of inflation continue to influence the NPC's thinking, or said. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand began lowering its official cash rate in August and stepped up its easing with a 50 base point cut this month, taking the official cash rate to 4.75%. So that's still above the RBA's 4.35%. And the bank is expected to deliver another 50 basis point cut at its final policy decision of the year on November the 27th, with markets pricing in some risk of even a 75 basis point cut. Or remarked in his speech that central banks must at times act swiftly to avoid perils, something that they've had to do in recent years. But he also said during a question and answer session, that after hiking rates aggressively to tame inflation, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand can take a more measured and circumspect approach to easing. On the way down, we can be more incremental. And we have been, he said. We've been more incremental because we're in calmer waters, but also because of that lingering inflation persistence on the domestic side. Even as policy is eased, it is still on the restrictive side and it will remain there over the coming quarters as we get more and more confident that pricing behaviour has renormalised, or said. And the governor flagged a steady pace of rate cuts, Goldman Sachs economist said in a research note after his speech. On balance, we interpret the governor's comments as reducing the probability that the Reserve Bank steps up to a 75 basis point cut in November, they said, restating their forecast for another 50 basis point cut. Investors have trimmed bets on the 75 basis point move in November, pricing in a 24% probability today, down from 38% yesterday. Using the inflation, which peaked at 7.3% in 2022, has actually slowed to 2.2%, putting it back inside the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's 1% to 3% target. But... That's largely been driven by a decline in imported or tradables prices. A gauge of domestic inflation remains elevated at 4.9%. On the other hand, the economy is likely to see a second recession in less than two years. and Unemployment is rising, fueling calls for a swift reduction in interest rates. Or didn't focus, by the way, on the current weak state of the economy, saying that only economic activity will be revitalised as inflation stabilises and rates fall. So standing back, as the IMF says, economic developments over the past four years have had a lot to do with how individual countries have deployed fiscal and monetary policies since the pandemic. Australia's choice to hold rates lower while lifting government debt across states and federally, with most new jobs being created in the public sector, thus crimping productivity, this plus high migration, has kept inflation well above band, and there's little prospect of cuts anytime soon. But then, so far, we've avoided a technical recession, thanks to high migration, although many households are still feeling the pinch. New Zealand lifted rates faster and higher, and hit a recession, but is now cutting, and also cut migration, and did not pump up jobs in the public sector as Australia did. It will be interesting to see which strategy provides the better longer term outcomes. But for now, the fear of entrenched inflation and higher interest rates for longer suggests that the inflation battle in Australia has yet to be won. And with an election due by May next year, this could well spell trouble for the current government, although I'm not sure that the other mob is really much better. 
Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge, and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.